Yeah, hi, good morning. And like I don't normally say, but I'm actually happy to be here. I'm actually happy usually most of the time to be wherever I am. I, but I feel like saying it today, so I'm saying it. Uh, I think part of the reason is because I have a reputation of being a Luddite because I don't have a mobile phone and anyone who doesn't have a mobile phone these days is considered to be anti-technology and you know you're rejecting the modern world and you want to get back into the cave age and so with that kind of a reputation but without that kind of a sense about myself it's ha I'm happy to be part of this discussion. I'm starting on a personal note because this idea that if there is technology and you don't use it uh, or if you're not consumed by that technology there is something the matter with you and you can't have anything to do then with public policy and public spaces that uh, uh, that are working towards using and to optimizing for various kinds of people these technologies that's become like a refrain not among the people I see here I think but among people who want to silence those who are speaking questioning these technologies so I want to start therefore with saying that I'm not anti-technology not at all uh, but I do believe and I think we need to consider what that means I, I can't say I have a clear uh, understanding of this but that uh, we use technology but don't get controlled by technology technology doesn't become the master we don't become the, we don't become the uh, we don't become it's not about master and slave but we, do, we don't allow technology to use us or those who control technology to use us the second thing is that there is a way in which technology is constantly depicted as being neutral that there is it doesn't have a politics it it cannot be corrupted uh, it is like a clean, you know, it's the kind of thing that's also projected when uh, we are talking about the environment and we talk about uh, uh, the new technology that's coming and actually being environmentally extremely sound and very good in contrast with the kind of manufacturing uh, processes that we've had. And all those industries are dirty industries and this is a clean industry. There are all kinds of questions that come up in that too. So to keep that in our mind when we discuss the rest. But actually what I'm interested in, and I'm glad that this is what I've been asked to speak about, is about how the state, uh, what is the state feeling when these technologies are coming in? What is the state's uh, response to these technologies? What are we seeing? And uh, how, do, how, do we, uh, how do we understand our own need to respond to this? The one thing that's become clear over this last uh, three, four, five years especially, uh, has been the fear that the state has of freedom. Freedom is a threat to the state. And uh, freedom of a people is, it's actually many of the things that are being done in the name, uh, uh, because people are exercising their freedom and their liberties, are today seen as seditious. And the idea that any kind of challenge to the established order of the state uh, it should be quelled has resurfaced in a huge way it wasn't this bad uh, till about I mean between 1950 and or 1940 and uh, 1945 and maybe 2000 but it's inc it's got increasingly you know uh, more repressive not only because of technology of course but also because of the kinds of ambitions that the state has in relation to its territory its people so the idea that sovereignty has passed on to the state has had already come in even before uh, the the challenges that technology that uh, the internet is both well both opportunities that is giving to the people and the uh, the opportunities it's offering to the state to deal with us. So one concept in that uh, context is the idea of the commons, the human being as the the human body as a global commons, the human mind as the global commons on which many experiments can be done and which therefore will be ultimately controlled by a state, whatever the state may be. And the second thing is of passing on sovereignty from a people to the state because the state needs to ensure development, it needs to ensure law and order and the biggest thing that has come in now which is eroding uh, freedoms is terror, the idea of terror. It's not, it's not just terrorism itself, that is posing a certain set of problems. But in terms of the relationship with the state, the idea of terror has uh, helped. If you look at every incident that has happened, whether it's 9-11 or 26-11 uh, in Bombay, Kargil before that, parliament attack, 
So each of these have been uh, opportunities for the state to get to acquire more power for itself because it says I can't protect you, I can't protect my citizenry unless I have more power. And I, to do that, I also need information about everybody. So there's, a, there's an increasing greed that the state has for information about people. And there are various places to find it. One way of doing it is by bullying people and asking them to give information about themselves. There are a number of ways in which this is happening. Uh, for instance, when we uh, uh, find something like the Collection of Statistics Act, which sounds like the most benign act that you can have, which in 1952, 52 or 53 was first enacted because we were, India was then newly independent and we needed, you know, we from, like they would say, from pin to battleship, we were getting things from outside and we needed to become self-reliant. So the state needed to know what kind of industry was coming in, what kind of productivity was there. And it needed, inf th therefore, it needed a statistical department. It set up a statistical department which would collect this kind of data. It wasn't, it didn't go for primary data in the sense it didn't, the collection of statistic, statistics department, did not itself go and ask individuals, I mean even companies, industries to give the data. Whatever information was given by the industries to various people, whether it's to the lab labor department or to the company's department or whatever, could all be collected by the, you know, they would have access to it and it would give them, it would give, it would give them a means for analyzing how much development had happened, where you need to invest, you know, who do you need to promote, uh, what kind of infrastructure support is needed. So it was for that kind of purpose that they brought in the Collection of Statistics Act in the 1950s, early 1950s. And then in 2000, in, in around 2000, there was a review of this law. And they said that this law has actually, after liberalization, has stopped serving any purpose. So we need to change it. Now, if it serves no purpose, actually, in law, you just need to repeal it. There is no need to put something else in its place. But it's also an opportunity. So they created an opportunity for themselves. And now you have a 2008 law which says that the chief statistician, the stati you know, that department, can send people out, completely outsource everything, ask different people to go to individuals, to households, and to industries and whatever. But now it's reached the individual and the household, and ask them to give information on anything. There are no limits in that law on what kind of information can be asked. So, for instance, I mean, out of uh, just wanting to know uh, how this was view being viewed, uh, we checked out with the department and asked the chief statistician if, for instance, uh, one of the things is prenatal diagnostic techniques, which is proving to be a huge problem and there's a lot of movement around it. So the, uh, the question was, can, can somebody come and ask me, how many abortions have you had in your life, in your lifetime? They said, you know, well, they can, theoretically they can, but that's not the kind of thing we'll ask. And if you don't answer it, you can be punished by either making you pay, pay for it or through imprisonment. If you give wrong information uh, because you don't want to tell some fellow coming information about this or you want to forget about it yourself, you can be punished. You can be punished with imprisonment. Now, that to me was the beginning of the uh, bullying state, where the state actually believes it can bully you into passing on information by passing laws which will punish you. There was, an in, there was one in, uh, episode before this, when after Cargill they started this, uh, amending the Citizenship Act and then brought in the National Citizens Register, which is now the first stage is going on as the National Population Register, where they say that if you don't give information, um, the information asked, it's, it's 15, uh, uh, you know, uh, 15 fields of information. If you don't give that, the householder can be made to pay a 1,000 rupee fine, and of course you will have to give the information too. So the idea that the state has a right to know whatever it wants about any resident in this country, in, within its territory, has become a part of what's happening now. So it's in that context that we are also looking at uh, the power that the state wants to exercise over the internet, over our communications around, uh, uh, in, uh, on the internet, over what is being said, what's being spoken about, who likes what, and that that can be actionable. Now, so it, this is not therefore about protecting people from defamation or whatever. This is really about protecting the state from a people and protecting persons, personalities within the state 
from anything that might be said by a people. This actually, as a lawyer, I must say that this inverts, this completely inverts the idea that per personalities, in fact, personalities, in fact, cannot uh, ask for protection by pre-censorship. You can, at best, go in a defamation suit later. You can, you can charge them with defamation. And post facto, if they find that, in fact, there was defamation, they can be whatever, you know, whatever the law has to offer. But the moment there are people whose lives are out in the public, prime ministers, party leaders, whatever, you know, none of them has a right to say that you, you, know, you have to go through a censorship process before you can write about me. This changes it on it, you know, it takes, turns it on its head and says, no, no, they need to be protected from what kind of speech might emerge and from the, from the kind of speech that emerges on the internet. So the, the, uh, the, what we are therefore seeing in terms of understanding what this is, the way I understand it today is that the state does not like freedom. It, in fact, uh, Kanabira, I mean, I, I never tired of quoting this, but he had a, he was a civil liberties uh, lawyer. He was a lawyer in Andhra who, did, who was a civil liberties uh, leader. And uh, he, uh, he, he's done this book where he tells us some nuggets. We just pick up the sentences and it gives us a whole, uh, you know, it gives a whole book in your own head. It's like that. So one of the things he says is how over these years, uh, although in the Indian context we are supposed to have a constitution that gives us fundamental rights, uh, and there can be reasonable restrictions on those rights. What's happened over the years is that the, it is the restrictions that have become fundamental. <laughs> and then you have uh, whatever is left over are the rights for which you need to get permission to exercise. So the example we used to give earlier was of processions. You know, earlier you went to the middle of the road and stood there because you wanted people to hear you. And now they say, no, no, you can't come and disrupt traffic. We are not disrupting traffic. We are telling people that this is what's happening, right? You can't disrupt traffic, so you, ha you move away from places where you might be in the way of anybody else. And so now there are something like, I think in Tamil Nadu, there are 33 conditions that the uh, police can impose on you. It's come over, and it's developed over time. Little by little by little, incrementally, it's come to th 33 conditions. And... Uh, um, after, uh, uh, after you fulfill those 33 conditions, then you still have to go and get permission from the police before you can. Uh, and even if it's a protest against the police, by the way, so you have to go to them and take their permission and do whatever. So it's, a, it's that kind of uh, mindset that we are seeing when we are, uh, when we are looking at this. That restrictions have in fact become fundamental and you're answerable to the state at every stage and punishable if the state thinks that what you're doing is not okay. To my mind, this comes from a, from a genuine fear of freedom and seeing freedom as something that is disruptive and against the established order. Now, what are the ways in which we've seen some of this emerge in recent times? One of the very interesting ones that happened was uh, the National Intelligence Grid, NAT Grid. It's occasionally written about, we see it in the papers. The NAT Grid is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. It, is, uh, it was set up in December 2009. But it was not fully established because cabinet had not yet given its permission. And uh, they'd given conditional clearance saying, okay, let's try it. So in uh, December 2009, it was established for a period of uh, 18 months. Uh, and they appointed, it, appointed to it a person who had earlier been, you know, he was originally in the army and then he went off to the private sector. And in his last uh, stint in the, uh, was with the Mahindra Security services services and he was the head of that uh, institution and while he was in that position he wrote a small four page document where he said uh, he called it a nation of numb people and the essential logic of it was that the state is not capable of protecting people because it's busy protecting its borders and it has insurgencies everywhere and so you can't expect it's not going to protect the individual it's certainly not going to protect the uh, corporations so what you uh, need to do, therefore, is maybe for a hundred cor top corporations to get together and form private territorial armies. When he was confronted with this after he was appointed to the NAT grid, he said, no, 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 I didn't mean that they should form. I said, that is what will happen because the state is not willing to, uh, you know, is not able to take care. And therefore, the state has to gear itself up. Of course, that's kind of not, uh, not a very convincing uh, explanation because he was speaking to corporations. He was not speaking to the state through that document. 
Now, he's the head of national intelligence grid. Perfectly decent person. It's got nothing to do with who he is. It's about the kind of mindset that uh, you bring to this. Now, the national intelligence grid uh, therefore carried on in this way. And then finally, after 18 months, it was extended. Uh, there are extraordinary things about it, which I won't mention at this point, but they are really truly extraordinary. The idea of this national intelligence grid is that it should be able to get information real time about anybody that they want and feed it to 11 security and intelligence agencies. Now, many of these security and intelligence agencies are not subject to any kind of supervision. It's not controlled by any law. And therefore, they are a law unto themselves. Maybe, I mean, some of them are perhaps doing, doing work that's important to the country, but the fact is that they are uncontrolled by anybody and there's no supervision. They don't have any reporting structure. There is no means of auditing the work that they do. There is nothing. Now, this... Uh, uh, national Intelligence Grid uh, was made a presentation to the cabinet uh, I think 2012 12 May maybe and an RTI was the, somebody filed an RTI saying just give us the presentation you've made to the cabinet on what the project is about it is not as if it was any information that had been derived through the project that they were asking for they just said give us this information and the, they deferred the answer for a while and then they replied saying that, oh, by the way, we've just got it notified and exempted it from the RTI. So it doesn't come within the Right to Information Act, no, because we too, we are helping all these security agencies, we too are m making ourselves part of the security establishment where no information will be given to anyone. So that tells us also that, you know, who are these people who want to monitor us and what, is, what are the kinds of sources that they are uh, looking for? That's now an appeal. I mean, nothing has happened yet. But the fact is that there are many of these agencies which want to know everything about us, who are hiding themselves away and unwilling to tell us even who they are. So it's, it's really like the American FISA kind of thing. No? There will be a secret court to issue a secret order which nobody will know about, but you'll be impacted by. If you get caught out, what do they do? So what did, uh, what, did, what did, in fact, the American establishment do? You know, when Glenn Greenwald wrote Now, uh, this, he had written, a, he had published a book in 2011 on what had happened in 2005-06. And some of us didn't know that that's what it was about an earlier episode. So, I mean, we didn't, we didn't connect it up. It, it read exactly the same. You were reading the newspaper, you were reading the book, you wondered how he pre-wrote the book even before it happened. Because it had already happened. It's just that this time it's become huge and big. The last time it happened, obviously, much more quietly than it did this time. But the last time around, what happened? The, um, the, gov you know, the government had asked them, the NSA had asked for information. All these companies, Google, Yahoo, uh, what the others, Facebook, I don't even know the names of the others, Oracle, I don't know, all kinds of people had given information uh, to the... Uh, to the NSA because there was an order from the FISA court saying, you know, give this information. But there was another law that was also in place at that time, which is a privacy law, which said that if, you, if any company is going to divulge information to any agency, they need to let the person know to whom they've divulged, uh, whose information they have divulged. So as a person whose data is being held by somebody else, if that somebody else is going to hand over the data to someone, I am entitled to know that my information has been handed over. I may not be able to stop it, but I at least need to know that it's happened. They may not even tell me because it's secret who they've handed it over to, but they would have to tell me that they had breached that, you know, breached that privacy uh, relationship between us. So, of course they did not because it was LSA, so they did not tell anybody. And then the companies got worried. Because if, they, if anybody found out, and people were beginning to fi find out, and they went to court in the American system, they would be made to bleed. They would, I mean, they would, their profits would just, you know, would just plummet because they would have to pay out to a large number of people. And that's something that, no, so both things in terms of losing their monies and losing reputationally. And that's the one thing I think we need to remember too, that companies which are involved in this are really worried about reputational loss in terms of uh, the safety and of, of the individual. When the individual starts feeling threatened, then they're going to wonder about how much they want to use these uh, technologies in this kind of format. So all companies which are on the internet constantly have privacy meetings, to which they call everybody, especially people who 
you know, who are attacking this, the violations of privacy, they will all get caught because they are really worried. They want to be able to put in the kind of privacy, uh, you know, privacy policies which will reassure us while they can keep carry on, carrying on with their business as usual. So they need actually uh, the intervention of people uh, at one level, they need us for the first time. Companies need us today, not just as customers, but also as people who will lobby for them in not allowing the state to acquire too much power over that information. So it's the corporations which want to be retaining and using that information. And not, you know, so they, they need citizenry intervention to protect them against the state because that will result in huge, it could result. I mean, they fear that it could mean that people use, use them less or differently, which may mean a certain leaching of profits. So, so the corporation and all of this. And corporations are interested for a range of reasons. Some of them, it's about developing technologies, which we want them to do. It's not like, you know, we are not, uh, we are not contesting, we are not challenging their uh, uh, integrity in looking for various kinds of technologies and bringing them in. But the way in which these technologies are used and the closeness that is emerging between the state and the corporation raises different kinds of issues. Now, there, there is a report that was uh, prepared by Mr. Nilakani as chairperson, which is called the TAGAP report. It's called the Technology Advisory Group on Unique Projects. Uh, actually, Mr. Nilakani is one of his kind, so it's not surprising that he's interested in unique projects. Now, in this project, he has, uh, uh, he, he's, sorry, that was just a night one. Uh, in, in this, although it's true, oh, I mean, you, ca you can't. He's contesting the election from my constituency. Yeah, but I don't know if you recognize the levels to which ambitions go, but we'll talk about it when the camera is not on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, the Technology Advisory Group on Unique Projects was, uh, in initially, it was set up saying that what we are interested in is these um, uh, five revenue-related uh, functions of the state. Hi. No, no. Come. Hi. No, 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 no. You're not at all disturbing as well. Uh, so the uh, five revenue-related functions of the state, so including income tax and customs and, uh, and interestingly, the goods and services tax. So that's what they started with. It seems like a perfectly uh, innocent endeavor where what they're talking about is, uh, um, is making, you know, making these systems function more efficiently. The report starts with saying that all this information, this is not something that states can handle. You know, technology has overtaken the state. And therefore, you need to give it to companies which will understand this and which will be able to bring in efficiency into the system. So what we need, according to the report, not according to me, are, is the handing over of all the data that the government has in each of these areas to private companies which will act in the public interest which will be profit making but not profit maximizing. And the, uh, these private companies would have up to st uh, about 26% you can have of the state, uh, state can have a share, and 26 to 49% they could, but 26% they definitely will, at least when it is set up. And then, uh, so 51% at least will be in private hands. And they will then it form a company which will make profits from governmental data but it is worthwhile because you're going to be handing this over, you know, you're going to assist the state in its functions. Now, the idea that this, you know, the, the, when I say the closeness, actually the latest economist was interesting. I don't know, maybe not the latest now. When I read it, it was the latest. It's a, the one of the red cover, which talks about, uh, you know, divesting everything that the state, the state should sell off all that it has. The state should sell the land that it has, the, you know, the resources that it has, the rights that it has in any companies. Just sell all of it off. And that's the big push now, for which they say it is important to make everything transparent and visible. So you need to have the kind of data base that you can keep, which will make everything transparent and visible. So when, you know, the... Um, the and then you can data mine through that and give 
some of that data which you're going to have. So they've already set up a company, by the way, called the Goods and, uh, uh, it's, I don't know what it's called, but it's a Goods and Services Tax Network. They've got the Articles of Association Memorandum, everything in place. And 51% shareholders are banks. So these are not technology companies who are going to work on the technologies. These are banks like HDFC and ICICI who are going to be getting this information and keeping it with them. Now, what is interesting, why I mentioned this apart from other reasons, I mean, apart from the complicity between state and the corporation, is that if you notice what's been happening in the CAG thing, uh, you know, the CBC, the CB, in, uh, on the DISCOMs. CAG audit. CAG audit. So when you look at the, uh, the, what they've said in court, when they've gone to court, they've said, we are private companies, you can't subject us to CAG audit. Keep us out of this. So the idea that the state will not have more than, you know, will not have more than 49%, and it will keep it out of all kinds of audit, and then the state becomes the primary customer of the corporation is a theme that is recurring. So the data that we hand over without our permission, without so much as a bio leave, with no law to govern it, with nothing, we will just be handed over to companies. So there is an unholy nexus that is developing between, and a closeness that is extremely uncomfortable for the rest of us, between the companies and the state. So that's, that's one of the things to remember. A couple of other things on how they think we should, they should control our speaking to each other and the internet and whatever. I, you, you have seen the cyber cafe rules. I think the cyber cafe rules is one of the most uh, both paranoid and ridiculous pieces of, uh, you know, it's not legislation but whatever, of lawmaking that you have. It says that every time you go into a cyber cafe, in fact, Richard Stallman was talking in Bangalore a while ago, in, uh, no, in Bombay, and he said that when he was in a hotel, he couldn't use the cyber cafe there because they asked him to give his identity, they wanted to take his photograph, they wanted numbers from him. He said, who are these people? Somebody running a cyber cafe, why will I give all this information to them? Now that's the kind of rules that have been brought in. So you have to give your an ID which is in, unimpeachable, your photograph will be left with whoever this person is, and your, your telephone number, your address, uh, and all the sites that you have visited. So they have to keep this information for at least a year. So there is no, there's not, there's no, no ceiling on how long they keep it, but at least a year, a minimum of a year they have to keep it. It's an absurd piece of legislation which serves no purpose and it's done in the name of terror. But it means that they can monitor everybody through this process. Now one thing that I, in, from my work I find deeply distressing in the way the internet is taking over is the, well, two, two quick things. One was on the electronic services deli delivery bill which is not on the internet, which is not about the internet, but which is about, which is, which is attempting to get mediated through this. And when Nikhil comes, I think he'll talk about, we have some differences and a lot of agreement on some of the work that he does. Uh, on the electronic services delivery bill, we were told that the advantage of this bill would be that people need not go to the state, which means there will be less corruption. So the, you know, you go to most of the places where poverty exists, you will, you're not going to find officials going to those areas. They, they, won't, they won't be going there. And people are not to go, there are, it's not just a wall and a reception desk, but now you will also have uh, the electronic uh, services delivery, which means that you can, only, you can only speak to the state through this, you know, through this electronics, you, I mean, through what you can't speak through any other medium. And that is such an absurd proposition in almost any country, but certainly where pe people don't have access to this, they don't control the uh, technology, I mean, many of us may have laptops and whatever, but many people don't have access to any of that and they have to mediate it through somebody else. So you can't go directly. The idea of directness has got lost. I think the idea of directness got most lost on the direct benefit transfer, and I can talk about that later, but, you know, the most absurd term, it's like changing, you know, somebody said once that 500 years later, if... Uh, a dictionary were written, which is, you know, which draws from today, um, Vedanta would mean exploitation of tribals or whatever. And Satyam would mean telling lies and fudging <laughs> accounts. So we are really changing our lexicon through this, you know, what is this direct? And uh, there was one other thing which of course by now we've forgotten, but then you know about the CMS. I don't think we needed the CMS. If you've watched the certain, that is a, a computer, what is that? Electronic. 
emergency response team. Emergency response team. And you watch the way in which we've had conversations where they've sat with a gentleman who heads it has threatened people that, you know, I know exactly from which computer to which computer in your office you're having messages go. So they've been doing it even before they brought this in. What we therefore needed was controls on these. And that's the last thing I'll stop with, which is this, that when the UID project was started and we asked Mr. Nilakani about, you know, privacy, and privacy was only one of the concerns, but many other things, he said, what are you making such a big song and dance about? You know, everything is on the internet. You have, you know, if I want to know anything, I just have to look at your voter list, at the voters list which is on the internet, and everything is there. You're giving more information to Google and to Facebook than we are ever going to take from you. So what's your big deal about privacy? The point, therefore, is that we are actually looking for controlling these so that we get back into control over the technology and not let the technology become our masters.